Hello everyone, I'm Sula, host of Sula's Big Adventures, and this is chapter 9 of my multi-part series, Sula's Complete Video Guide to Becoming an Amateur Astronomer. Chapter 9, Observing the Moon. When Italian astronomer Galileo heard about the invention of the spyglass, he built his own version, and the first thing he looked at was the moon. Galileo's telescope had an aperture of only 15 millimeters, but he was able to see the craters and the plains on the moon, dispelling the belief that the moon was smooth and uniform. Galileo thought that the plains were seas, and that is why the dark patches on the moon are called mare, which is Latin for sea, and the plural is maria. Our nearest celestial neighbor is only 235,000 miles away. It's close enough that much detail can be discerned with just a pair of binoculars or even a small refractor, even 60 millimeters. Much more detail can be discerned with larger telescopes, but anything over eight inches has diminishing returns due to seeing conditions or atmospheric turbulence. The craters and plains we see today are the same ones that Galileo first looked at in his little telescope back in 1609. The craters are named after prominent philosophers and scientists. The plains, or the dark patches, are called mare. Directions on the moon. When observing the moon with your naked eye or a pair of binoculars, it looks the same. North is north and south is south. But if you're observing with a Newtonian reflector or a Dobsonian, the view is inverted. And if you're viewing with a refractor or a cassegrain that uses a diagonal, then the view will be a mirror image. And that's why maps that have a mirror image of the moon are very helpful to help you find your way around. Here to Coyote. <laughs> the round edge of the moon is called the limb. Billions of years ago, the moon was much closer to the Earth than it is today, and hence the gravitational pull was much stronger, and eventually this caused the moon's spin on its axis to cease, and it's perpetually locked on the side forever facing the Earth. People often call the other side the dark side of the moon, but that is a misnomer. It's not dark. It looks very similar to the side that faces the Earth, and this has been confirmed by a spacecraft looping around the moon in 1959. The moon takes 29.5 days to make one orbit around the Earth, and hence the word for month comes from moon. During the time that the moon goes through its phases, different parts will be illuminated by the sun. Because of this, and except at the full moon, the disk we see of the moon will always be partly sunlit and partly in shadow. And the boundary between the two is called the terminator. And the terminator is the best place to point your telescope because the hills at the terminator are illuminated at a low sun angle and thus have long dramatic shadows and rough ragged lines. Unlike the limb, which is the round edge, which is circular and smooth. During the 29.5 days that it takes the moon to orbit, orbit the earth, it goes through phases. The point where the moon is between the earth and the sun, only the dark unlit side is facing us, and this is called the new moon, or there's no moon. As it passes from new moon, more and more of the disk becomes visible each night or day, you can see it during the day, from night to night, and the moon will move 12 degrees eastward so that it also rises 50 minutes later each day, except at the autumnal equinox, when it rises at higher latitudes about 25 minutes later each night. And that's probably why it's called the harvest moon. It gave people harvesting more uh, uh, moonlight to harvest by. From new moon to full moon takes 14 days, and this phase is called waxing gibbous. Like tonight is day 10 of the moon. After the full moon, the disk begins to fade, and this is called the waning phase for another 14 days to new moon. The waning moon does not rise until late in the evening, 
and it stays in the sky until after sunrise. So the waxing moon is the best time to observe it, with the days before full moon the best. When it's full, it's blinding, and there's no dramatic terminator to study. However, the full moon is the best time to see the prominent rays emanating from the great crater Tycho. There are special events concerning the moon. Twice a year, the moon passes into the shadow of the Earth, and we get a lunar eclipse. You can only see a lunar eclipse if it occurs when it's nighttime, wherever you are. When the moon is new, you can see Earth shine, and that is sunlight reflected off the Earth onto the otherwise darkened surface of the moon. Sometimes while observing the moon, the limb will move in front of a star, and that's called occultation and it will block the star for about 60 minutes. And it's really cool to observe that. It's kind of shocking when you're looking at a star and all of a sudden it disappears. Another effect is called libration. The direction of the moon's pole is tilted 6.7 degrees and its orbit is not exactly a circle. So it doesn't move at exactly the same rate that it orbits. As a result of this inclination, it's easier to see various features of the moon near the limb at different times in its orbit. In the three to five day old moon, that's the best time to see Mare Crisium. That's a dark plain that's circular in appearance, and it was once a vast crater flooded by lava. At first quarter, or a six to nine day old moon, you can see Mare Tranquillitatis, or the Sea of Tranquility, where Apollo 11's eagle landed. The landing site is not far from a crater called Masculine, and on the edge of Nectaris, which is joined to Tranquility, are three huge craters that contrast with the plains of the Nectaris. Most impressive is the 67 mile wide Theophilus, with walls 21,000 feet above the floor. Theophilus was formed a few billion years ago. It was smashed down by its neighbor, uh, Cyrillus, and below that is Katharina, which has crumbled walls 9,000 feet higher than its rumble-strewn floor. The vast lunar plains of Tranquillitatis and Serentatis our filled in remains of craters that were blasted out of the lunar surface by asteroids crashing into the moon. At the 9 to 11 day old moon waxing gibbous, you can see the monster crater Clavius, 144 miles across with two 30 mile wide craters within it. The walls of Clavius are three miles above its floor. Tycho, another prominent crater, can be seen during the waxing gibbous phase. It's 50 miles wide and rises two and a half miles above the floor, and the jagged appearance is best when the terminator is nearby. You can also see Copernicus, 60 miles wide and prominent in the flat lunar plane. There are many other features to look at on the moon, and you can spend hours and days studying the moon and a good place to find out more about other features other than just the ones that I've gone over are the beginning of Turn Left at Orion has a section on the moon and also YouTuber John Reed has a book called 50 Things to See on the Moon. It's a very basic beginner book but has some interesting things to look at. And another good reference would be the Backyard Astronomer's Guide 4th edition in which Alan Hewitt White has a section of moon tours. And those are excellent. And there are probably other things you can find. And you can get a moon map and get one with a mirror image if you're looking with a refractor or a Cassegrain telescope and then it will look like what you see with your eye through your telescope and that's very helpful. So hope you enjoyed this episode of Observing the Moon. I'll see you in the next episode. Until then, I hope you have access to dark skies and that you're getting out there and enjoying them. 
So long till next time. Sula, signing off. <laughs>